Ruby Roses, it's time for us to talk about shipping, about shipping Ruby Rose 2 from Asia all the way to Turkey, which is where we are now. And we've got a few topics. Teresa yes. has told me not to go off topic too much, <laughs> so I'm going to try and stick to the format. So we're going to go through today. Why are we shipped? What else? What's after why we shipped? Because like, you told me to remember a list and I could remember one thing. Why are we shipped? This is why the list is right here. Uh, we're going to talk about why we decided to ship in the first place. We're going to talk about the process of shipping. Yep. We're going to discuss how we prepared Ruby Rose 2 for the shipping, because it was a whole preparation. Uh, we're going to talk about how long the transit took and then unloading the boat in Turkey as well. And then we are going to talk about damage to the boat and how we're resolving that with insurance and the shipping company's insurance. I'm Teresa, this is Nick, and this is Ruby Rose 2, our floating home. Join us as we settle into life on board our brand new catamaran, documenting our adventures and never shying away from the reality of boat life. Subscribe to our channel and leave a comment because we love to hear from you and a big thanks to our community of patrons. Good. Right. Let's start with one, which is the thing I remembered. Why did we ship, Therese? Okay, well, we've been through this before and I don't want to get too bogged down because I think that people have strong opinions on, the, on this, which is kind of a little surprising, although it's the internet, so maybe not. Basically, in a nutshell, try not to waffle on for too long, we decided to ship from Thailand to Turkey because we had always had this dream and vision in our mind of us sailing our own boat around Greece. Greece holds a very special place in our hearts, especially Nick's heart. We have a real emotional connection to Greece because Nick has been coming here for 25 years. Nick's parents live here. And ever since we first got together and we were talking about kind of hatching this mad plan to buy a boat and live on board, we always said that it would be such a dream come true for us to have our own boat in the harbour where Nick's parents live and to kind of sail into port um, into Nick's second home basically. So when we originally decided to buy a catamaran we had planned to take delivery in Europe because this boat, may, many of you may not know this, but this boat was originally planned to be built by Seawind Europe. Uh, that never happened because of a little something called Covid. So anyway she got stuck, no, she was built in Vietnam instead and we took delivery in Thailand as you all probably know. But we still wanted to fulfill this dream of sailing around Greece. So we decided to sail from, from Thailand to the Med. And that was something that we had planned to do. As many of you know, uh, if you go through the Red Sea, that is a passage that is um, considered to be quite, I don't know if I go so far as say dangerous, but there's definitely some major security concerns. And over the years, that security situation has changed a lot. So it's a very um, fast changing situation. But nonetheless, at the time we said, okay, like we think that we're, we can do this, let's do it. Unfortunately, as we all know, um, and I can't say the key words because YouTube probably demonetize us, but we all know what's happening in that region now. And we were completely unable to get insurance. And quite frankly, we didn't have the appetite, the risk appetite to take that journey anyway. Well, we can't get insurance. And yeah, if we get demonetized for this. No, no, no. We're not allowed to say anything. We can't even say the, no. the H word? No, no, absolutely not. We don't, don't, don't say it. <laughs> don't say it. Okay. So, don't say it. so basically someone and the blowfish. Uh, <laughs> cause a few problems in, in a, a country that begins with Y. And so basically no one can get shipping. Insurance. Yeah, exactly. So, so basically. And this is relevant, this is relevant. So we, the alternative is to sail around the Cape of Good Hope, but that would essentially turn into an 18 month long delivery trip. And I think you're probably thinking, oh, it's not that far. I've got Google Earth on my laptop. I can see that it's not that far. I'm not gonna get into it. I've already gotten into discussions on the internet about how long that journey would take. Believe me when I say it would be an 18 month long delivery trip. We would have had to wait for the leg to cross the Indian Ocean to start that odyssey and then onwards. So yeah. it just wasn't a timing gonna, issue. it just wasn't going to work for us. Yeah. So, so we decided to ship basically is what is the long-winded way of um is the short way of saying what I've just taken a long time to say. There is a cost implication for sailing a boat as well and that is wear and tear. And the wear and tear that we would have done in three ocean crossings would have probably been a significant part of the shipping cost. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And that's something that is often forgotten about when talking about shipping, actually. This is slightly tangential. But uh, we have crossed the Atlantic twice on our old, old boat, Ruby Rose. And not only that, but we did that with rallies. So we were able to do that in, in, a, you know, in company and have 
a lot of information about not just our experience but other cruisers experience doing the same ocean crossing and we know that crossing an ocean is very expensive and this is something i think that is forgotten about as i said before when comparing costs of shipping a boat versus just sailing the boat from a to b um, it's not just a time expense as in it will take you sometimes years longer to sail the boat but to prepare a boat to cross an ocean is very expensive. You need a lot of extra equipment, you need a lot of redundancy, you need a lot of spares that you wouldn't ordinarily need if you were doing coastal cruising where if something breaks you can just go and get it from the nearest marina or whatever. To ship, to sail a boat across an ocean you need all of those spares on board and don't underestimate how much that costs. Not only that but breakages as Nick said, sailing from Thailand to the Med would have included three ocean crossings. I guarantee you something. I mean, at the very least, we would have worn through our sails. Like, if nothing else, we would have worn through yeah. our, our sails. And that, those sails are probably half the cost of shipping. In addition to that, over the last month or so, our water maker has exploded again. Yeah. And we wouldn't have had the spare on board, so we'd have been somewhere in the middle of, in the Indian Ocean with no no way of making water. So that is important to understand that the there is a price, there is a cost to wear and tear over the cost of shipping. And realistically speaking, it's just a fast forward button on our, on our sailing. So the initial process of shipping this boat was obviously choosing a shipping company. We contacted several, um, Seawind recommended one to us. They seemed completely disinterested in shipping, not just our boat, but from what I've heard, anyone's boat. I understand what you're saying about being subtle here, right? There are two shipping companies. There is Seven Star and who is the other one? Peters and May. Peters and May. Peters and May just would not pick up the phone. And we're not trying to get sponsorship here. They just would not pick up the phone. You can cut that out. <laughs> so they wouldn't pick up the phone. They wouldn't answer emails. It wasn't just us. Peters and May were just radio silent. Obviously yeah. something was going on there. Yeah. Seven Star, completely different thing. Completely yeah. different. We contacted a Seven Star agent. I think they replied in an hour. Yeah. Seven Star were very, very on the ball with everything. And yeah. we are not sponsored by Seven Star. There is no money exchanging hands. We literally are just customers paying, paying what Seven Star asked. Yeah. Prices change almost monthly because shipping costs are so varied. And unfortunately, what I would say to you is the one thing that was a slight bait and switch for us was that we paid the deposit for Seven Star I think on a Sunday, where they assured us on the Sunday that they would be going through the Suez Canal and it would be X price. On the Y, on the Monday, literally 12 hours after we paid the deposit, they turned around and said, oh, we're now going around the Cape and we've got to put the price up 20%. Yeah, so that that was something that we had anticipated. They obviously sent us a contract. The contract is uh, very heavily skewed towards the transport company. It it, leaves, it's completely, it, it's, yeah, it's it leaves, heavily skewed. It is completely skewed. We had no rights. We had no rights at all. And and it, when we read the contract, we're like, wow, okay. Yeah. Like no no protection at all for the our boat or us as, as customers. So I mean, just, it was an old level, an old testament level of kind of like skewing it. Like yeah. your firstborn son, like <laughs> sacrifice a goat and your stuff. So basically, yeah. We so we, we knew, so we knew that this was something that could happen. We spoke to the agent at length. We said, are you going through Suez? Like we need to be assured of that. And he said, absolutely, we've got insurance. We're going to go through Suez. But you know, like read the fine print. We have the right at any time to change that plan. As Nick said, 12 hours later, the plan changed. It turns out that they couldn't get insurance to go through Suez, just like everyone else. And they had to go around the Cape of Good Hope, which added a lot of, a huge amount of cost onto the entire um, situation and we had to pick up that it. bill. We copped it. Yeah. And you might consider shipping a boat to be something like booking a ticket on a bus or a plane or something where you're given a date and that date is when you put the boat onto a ship. But that is not how it works at all. And so we booked in a certain date or a rough date and um, that changed significantly. It's a very fluid situation. So, and I have to say, that the seven star agent was fantastic. He yep. would email us, not just us, every, all of the customers, several times a week with an update. Okay, your ship is currently in Hong Kong and the ETA for Phuket is this date at the moment. And literally he was doing that for about yep. four weeks prior to shipping. We did have some delays. We had about a week delay or maybe about, about two weeks. So, anyway. So props to Chris from seven star. Yep. Like actually, he actually made the whole experience very, very easy to yep. do. And one thing is that the delays, the delays in shipping our boat meant that I had a commitment to work in Vietnam as a yeah. surgeon and I had to leave. And what they did on top of that, and they're like, okay, we told them way, way in advance, I have to leave on this date because I've got kids to treat. And they sent a skipper 
to prepare help Teresa get the boat to the shipping boat, which was great of them. Yeah. They didn't charge us for that, and so thank you again to Seven Star. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about the actual process of getting Ribiru's to prepared to ship, because this was something that it's the type of thing that you only ever probably do once and we had never done before. So we were feeling quite apprehensive about how we actually prepare the boat itself for shipping. As Nick said, uh, first of all, Chris from Seven Star was amazing. He gave us a lot of instruction. As Nick said, we also had a skipper um, who was there to help me get Rose to from the dock onto the ship. And this was something that he was very experienced at. So the skipper actually was hugely valuable. He was a really lovely Dutch guy. Um, and he uh, gave us a lot of advice as to how to prepare um, the boat as well. And he actually did a check. He did a walkthrough, made sure everything was done to his satisfaction. And, you know, he kind of gave us the go ahead. So we were, I was very grateful to have his experience as well. But the preparation essentially was take all the fabric off the boat. So no cushions, no nothing on board. Take the foresail off and leave the main on. And that was it. And basically anything that flaps, like un make it unflappable. Yeah. And it, so that was it. So basically everything stowed. And I think what he said was prepare the boat as you would for a hurricane. Yeah. So things that are rolling around inside, just take things off the galley work surface. Don't put anything that can fall, lay everything flat. And that's what we did. We just prepared as we would for a hurricane. Okay. So we are shipping the boat in only a few days and we need to get her ready to be shipped. There are lots of jobs to do. We basically have to the way it was explained to me was to set the boat up as though we're about to ride out like a really crazy storm or a hurricane or something. So sails are coming down, the four sails are coming down, I'm going to leave the main where it is just in the sail bag. We are also needing to kind of take off like all the cushions and everything outside like the floor matting in the cockpit, things that also not only could fly away but get really dirty like if there's a lot of dust and dirt and rain and whatnot we need to stow everything inside really securely um, we need to obviously do the basic things like cleaning everything the boat is pretty filthy so we need to clean her um, we need to get her ready to be left for about seven weeks so that means like pickling the water maker for example the skipper helped me get the boat off the dock and to the ship so the ship was at anchor about I think about four miles away from the marina in Phuket and we were told you got to be there at 9 a.m and so off we went and we were there at a quarter to nine and then sure enough uh, we weren't able to load the boat until about 1 p.m. You bring the boat along like the boat alongside the ship you throw them a line and the you know the guys kind of secure you and then the crane lowers the um, slings down into the water and they actually send a couple of divers underwater to secure the the straps the slings so that you know obviously the, the boat can be lifted off out of the water and onto the ship but if there's any kind of current then the slings will move um, so they have to wait until they can do that and they don't know how strong the current is until like literally moments before. So my little list was um, to turn off, obviously you had to turn everything off on the boat. Depressurize the fresh water system, cover instruments with hard covers, um, turn off the AC at the breakers, turn off the DC switches, turn off all the batteries, uh, take my day bag with me, so my laptop and my passport and everything. I'd left my big bag at the marina. Lock the boat, make sure the dinghy is secure, take one set of keys with me, give another set of keys to the shipping people, checking all the hatches are closed, closing all the blinds. If you're putting your boat on the hard, it's the same process. You close the boat down, you make sure nothing can break, you make sure that perishables are removed, and essentially the boat is lifted on, strapped down, and we wave goodbye to it. And that's, that's what happened. Chris then gave us he was very good actually. He gave us a full uh, kind of, he would always give us updates as to where the boat is. So we ended up with the ETAs of, it's going to be here, it's going to be then. And so we got very regular ETAs. The boat initially stopped in, I think, I believe Genoa or somewhere in Northern Europe. I think Gibraltar. Gibraltar. And yeah. then came to Manres where we met the boat. We they actually arrived one day early, which is great. Mm. We flew into Marmaris and literally booked a hotel, turned up. And then there's this big boat called the SV Maria with Ruby Rose on board. We were allowed on the boat for an hour uh, before she was dropped in just to inspect the hull. I asked that. I don't think they generally let you do that. No. So we went on just to, I just wanted to inspect everything. 
Unfortunately, we did find damage on the boat and there will be more of that in a few minutes. So the boat was damaged. But anyway, we got the boat in the water. It was lowered in very professionally, essentially the reverse process. They put it in slings. There are guys to kind of make sure everything's okay. Fenders down the side, their fenders. Boat is dropped in the water. A nervous moment for us when is it, is, are the engines going to start? You know, you always have these things. Everything started up. We gave them the thumbs up. We checked the bilges. We made sure that everything was okay. And we motored out of the slings. We were going to go to a marina for a night, but Marmaris Marina wanted 400 euros for the night. And for that, they can go and f themselves because 400 euros is not something I'm going to spend on one night in a marina. So we went to anchor uh, in just in a very beautiful bay, put the anchor down, put the kettle on, had a cup of tea. And so the whole process was pretty, pretty straightforward from deciding on a deciding on which shipping company to use. There was only one mm -hmm. getting the boat to the point of shipping, which was uh, Phuket. And again, really lovely couple of months sailing around there mm -hmm. and then waiting for five to six weeks to get the boat to Europe. Again, all pretty straightforward. When we got the boat anchored, we literally are sitting there going, okay, well now our season can start. Now, a couple of points that I wanted a thing, I need you to be aware of if you're thinking of shipping a boat, because I completely forgot about this. Number one, please check your insurance to make sure you are now insured for the area that you're sailing in. A few very, very frantic emails to uh, Top Sail, who we're insured with, and he came back and he's like, don't worry about it. When I knew you were shipping, because we have to get insurance for our own shipping, and it was actually covered by our insurance anyway, I just changed the area to Mediterranean. So that was- So brilliant. you'd already done that and forgotten about it. <laughs> no, I'd done, he'd done it and I hadn't checked. Okay. That's the first thing. Second point, and this is really important. I forgot to get charts for the med. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I forgot about that. But, okay, so you're thinking, this is 2024, right? We are in 2024 and you would think, oh, you can get charts for the med. I go online to download the charts. You can't download the charts. There are two makers of charts, one on Navionics and the other one is CMAP. You can download CMAP charts, but you have to have the serial number and something called an IO number for the plotter that you intend to put them onto. And I wasn't on the boat. So you have to actually get the Navionics charts delivered as hard little SD cards. So if you are doing this, please make sure that you have an, an aid memoir to remember to get your get your charts in advance. Anyway, did that through some frantic last minute kind of like shenanigans, got the boat unloaded, and then we spent a few days just firstly getting the sail back on, getting the sails up so we could actually sail the boat, and then looking at the damage. Now, damage to the boat. This is important. <clears throat> when we got to the uh, when we got when we got on the boat, we realized that everything and I mean every surface was covered in very, very fine brown spots, little chocolate brown spots or caramel spots everywhere, millions and millions and millions of them. And these were not being removed by cleaning. It would appear through the subsequent investigation that someone at some point either did some welding or some angle grinding on the deck of the boat and created a lot of tiny little iron particles, which then settled on the deck and that caused a whole amount, they rusted. So we got all these rust stains, which were just, we got oxalic acid on board and we cleaned a lot of it. But then we're kind of like, oh, this is not going anywhere and we can't shift all this. We just don't have the manpower. Like it would have taken months to get this stuff on because each square meter of boat that needed cleaning was just, it would take a couple of hours of work. When we finally got up to, uh, to the Sea Wind Europe, we contacted Seven Star and said, look, there's a lot of this. This damage is pretty like it, it's it's not just a simple clean and a polish. I'm going to give props to Seven Star here when in, in about a day they sent um, a surveyor down from the Turkish branch of Seven Star. He looked at it and went, OK, you've got some problems here. I will write a report for Seven Star. They sent a report and he said, look, there's about ten thousand dollars worth of damage here. That, that the, the, the cost of that is literally in the man hours involved in cleaning this boat and also the cost of lifting and stowing. Now we have, Seven Star have written, have it in written agreement, we have a written agreement from Seven Star that they will honor this and will pay it completely. We still have not been paid and we will obviously follow this up. Apparently the delay is because Seven Star have to claim on their insurance and then they have to go back to their loss adjusters and underwriters and come back to us. So we have written confirmation that we're going to be paid. 
we have not as yet. That's all going to play out over subsequent episodes. But uh, yeah, so far, so far, we're, we're happy with the response from Seven Star and the fact that they were, they took responsibility um, for the damage uh, because while we originally thought it was just part of the cleaning of the boat because the boat was absolutely filthy mm -hmm. um, and we were happy to just accept that as, as part of the, the fact that the boat needed a cleaning. Once we started that job, we realised that actually it was the rust stains were, as Nick said, it was absolutely everywhere, including all underneath the hull as well, which obviously we can't reach without it being hauled out. Um, so yeah, we're happy the seven staff taking responsibility. We still haven't seen any money, but uh, we'll keep you guys all updated. Overall, would we do it again? Yes. Very happy that we did it. Very happy with seven star. And thus far, we expect a full resolution to the insurance issue. And mistakes can happen. I say this to lots of people. Mistakes happen, it's how mistakes are resolved that actually make a company or a brand. So, quick talking heads video yeah. about our shipping experience. I hope you liked that and found it informative. Yeah. Yes, of course, it's not me standing around in a sarong drinking a beer, but- There's plenty of that. But there's that's plenty. Come. <laughs> so listen, I hope you enjoyed that. Give us a like, leave us a comment. If you want to comment about you're disappointed that we didn't sail, honestly, I don't care. I really don't <laughs> care what you think. But we'll be back next week. We're sailing the Mediterranean. So take care. Lovely to see you. Goodbye. Goodbye.